Good afternoon. My name is Skylar Martin. I am an enrolled member of the Stockbridge Muncie Band of Mohicans and a descendant of the Oneida Nation. I am also a patient navigator serving American Indians and Alaska Natives with the Mayo Clinic Comprehensive Cancer Center. I will be moderating this session. This is the second of a two-part series on nutrition and cancer prevention in American Indian and Alaska Native communities. We want people on this webinar to know that the session is being recorded so individuals who are not able to join us for this live session can watch it later. If you have questions related to this webinar topic, please type them in the chat function at the bottom of the Zoom screen. We will answer questions as time allows at the end of the session. I will now hand it over to Angie Murad, a patient educator at the Stephen and Barbara Slaggy Family Cancer Education Center at Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Angie is a registered and licensed dietitian. Thank you, Skylar. I appreciate it. So I wanna start this um, second part of our webinar series um, to just acknowledge and thank both Skylar Martin here that's moderating this session, as well as Trudy Jackson. Um, Trudy has transitioned into a new role as a community engagement coordinator, um, but she is also serving American Indian and Alaska Native patients at the Mayo Clinic Comprehensive Cancer Center. Um, so just want to thank them for, the, for helping me with both of these webinars. Um, and I want to acknowledge and, and let it be known that I am a white woman who is a dietitian, and by no means am I claiming to be an expert in traditional foods or customs of American Indians and Alaska Native community. And my goal of, this, of both of these presentations is to provide evidence-based nutrition recommendations, as well as um, resources and practical approaches um, that could be implemented into your daily life. So the information on today's webinar is not intended or implied to be a substitute for any medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Um, as always, work with your physician or qualified healthcare provider when adjusting any medication, supplements, or making any major lifestyle changes. And I want to talk just very briefly about Mayo Clinic Connect. Um, it's a digital platform where patients, family members, caregivers, as well as the community can connect and also get evidence-based cancer-related information, and as well as classes and webinars that our center here offers. Um, you don't have to be a Mayo Clinic patient to access our blog, um, and we encourage you to follow our cancer education blog on Mayo Clinic Connect um, so you can stay up to date on education opportunities. And recorded webinars like this one, as well as the last one that we did on this topic, can be found on the video library tab, which is on the drop down menu that says more, and you'll find the video library. And I wanted to also mention too that this recorded webinar takes about um, four business days to just get. Um, processed and put um, in the YouTube format and we post it on Mayo Clinic Connect. So um, just be on the lookout if you want to watch this webinar again or let people know um, and that we will have this um, webinar for those um, if you want to watch it again um, too. And I also put the link to Mayo Clinic Connect in the chat. So if you would like to follow our cancer education blog, please do so. And our learning objectives for today are to understand what challenges exist in accessing healthy foods, identifying, identifying at least two strategies to spend less at the grocery store, and recognizing three areas on the nutrition facts label to identify healthier food options. I want to start out, um, I used, I did have this slide on the last webinar just to talk a little bit about the medicine wheel, which is also known as the sacred hoop. And it's different, um, different tribes interpret the medicine wheel differently. However, one fundamental similarity besides this shape is that it does represent the alignment of the mind, body, emotion, and spirit. And that this circle shape represents the interconnectivity of all aspects of one's being. Um, including the connection with the, the natural world. Just because um, I want to just talk about um, also the social determinants of health, and by no means am I equating the social determinants of health with the medicine wheel, um, but I want to talk about how the social determinants of health have a major impact on per a person's health, well-being, and quality of life. 
So social determinants of health, some aspects of it um, are education, um, access to health care, um, the environment that we live in, our neighborhood, um, how well we're connected with the community, and also um, how whether we have economic stability and able to uh, purchase things we need to have better health. So I want to touch on the barriers to accessing healthy foods. And also just, again, reflecting on um, the My Native Plate from Indian Health Services, which shows, um, and I touched on how a plant-focused diet can really help improve health because it provides antioxidants as well as phytonutrients that can help prevent cell, um, cell damage, which may prevent certain types of cancers. Um, so just kind of talking a little bit about that again, um, not that every food group has to be at every single meal, but just it, how it emphasizes um, vegetables, half the plate, a quarter of the plate being a grain or some type of starch. It could be like cornbread, and it could even include um, starchy vegetables like corn or peas could also be in that top um, right quarter of the plate. And then the bottom um, right quarter of the plate could be an animal source of protein like deer, bison, fish. Um, and it uh, could also include pl plant sources of protein like beans. Um, and then on the side, fruit, um, and then making sure to include beverages that don't have a lot of calories in them because that can lead to um, weight gain. And we talked about carrying excess weight can also um, lead to certain types of cancers as well. So if you have limited access to these types of foods, um, you, it may affect your health. Um, so challenges in accessing healthy food would include things called um, food insecurity, which is defined as a lack of consistent access to enough food for every person in a household to live an active and healthy life. And this can be a temporary situation in a household or it can last for a long time. And part of what makes food insecurity so difficult to solve is that it often um, is caused by some of these things that I was talking about with the social determinants of health, whether that's um, poverty, not having enough money to purchase just some um, more fruits and vegetables and whole grains. Um, it could be due to being unemployed um, or underemployed and the um, and it's just deeply interconnected. And then moving in and out of food insecurity um, is just adds a lot of stress to the house household um, when you're already dealing with instability and unpredictability. And hunger impacts every community in the United States, yet Native Americans and American American Indians and Alaska Natives face uh, food insecurity um, in one out of four, where the rest of um, people in the United States face it one out of nine Americans overall. So you can see that it, it is um, it affects this community more so. And two, I also want to talk a little bit about the a food desert, um, which is a more serious degree of food insecurity because I was talking about how sometimes people can go in and out of food insecurity, but a food desert um, is just defined as certain parts of a country or a, a neighborhood or, or where you live that has limited access to fresh fruits and vegetables and other healthy whole foods. And it can exist in both rural and in large cities. Um, so Oftentimes they may have um, access to fast food or more convenience type foods, um, food stores, um, which limits the amount of, um, like I said, fruits, vegetables, whole grains. Um, and they don't have, it may be many miles to get to a grocery store. Um, they don't have access to farmer's market or healthy, affordable foods. And it's really um, what people, habitually eat and drink that affects their health over time. So how if you if someone is experiencing food insecurity or lives in in a in an area that doesn't is like a food desert, there are programs that are accessible to get access to 
um, healthier foods. For example, the food distribution program on Indian reservations or the FDPIR, um, sometimes often referred to as Kamads, um, is a program that began in the 1970s and gave American Indian and Alaska Native people living in rural on rural reservations an alternative to the food stamp program or what we call nowadays SNAP, which I'm going to talk to and talk about in just a second. Um, and it requires um, and SNAP often requires access to grocery stores. So this program provides foods um, from the USDA um, to so they can receive certain um, federal assistance. But there's often been criticism of this program because of the lack of avail availability of culturally appropriate foods. Um, tribal organizations that help administer this program have limited authority um, regarding the types of foods that are provided to the community. Um, and the foods are determined by the federal government. Um, so they don't always have broad access to traditional and indigenous foods um, like blue, blue cornmeal, um, catfish, salmon, walleye, wild rice, and bison, just as a, an example. And another issue um, is that the foods come directly from the USDA, um, which gets these foods from American producers, and it creates a barrier to food sovereignty or the right to control where and how to get food um, by directing the demand away from native food producers. Um, so in the next slide, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some changes to this program, um, but it's been a long time coming. Um, so also another place to access um, foods, if you are experiencing food insecurity, is the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, which I mentioned just briefly. And this provides nutrition benefits to families based on certain eligibility criteria. And the, gov the federal government pays full cost of the SNAP benefits and splits the cost of administering the program within the states which operate it. Um, next, there's the National Council on Aging, which offers assistance to low, uh, low income older adults facing hunger. Then I'll talk about the WIC program or the Women, Infant, Children uh, program, which is a special supplemental nutrition program for women, infants, and children up to the age of five that are at nutrition risk. The program's goal is to safeguard the health of low income women who are pregnant or breastfeeding, or even if they aren't breastfeeding um, and they've had recently had a baby. So, um, and I mentioned this program goes, um, is available to children up to the age of five. And it does allow um, these individuals to purchase healthy food items at grocery stores, farmers markets, or other places that accept the WIC payments. And the program is also uh, an added benefit is it does provide breastfeeding peer counseling support too, um, to encourage women to breastfeed. Um, so I encourage people to, if you are experiencing food insecurity or live in a food desert um, and find it difficult to access healthy foods, there are some things that might be available um, for you to access. And I think it's also important to mention as well, um, if you are experiencing the, um, this, to also talk about it with your um, healthcare provider um, or a dietitian to help get you connected um, with some of these programs. Um, the food distribution program on Indian reservations or FDPIR, I mentioned um, that there is a new, um, some new initiatives, um, the food sovereignty initiative and the USDA's food and nutrition service um, award was awarded 3.5 million to eight tribal nations for a project um, for the first time and this just happened um, last year and um, November of 2021 um, that will offer greater flexibility to reservations in the administration of this food distribution program. Um, and the goal is to promote traditional food ways and focus on food and agricultural markets to better align with food preferences of various tribes. Um, so there were seven projects and I'm going to talk a little bit about a few of them um, in this slide here. Um, so the first program that I'm going to touch on is the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance, 
um, Indigenous Seed Keepers Network. Sorry, that was a lot to say. Um, and the goal is to promote Indigenous cultural diversity for future generations by collecting, growing, and sharing heirloom seeds and plants. Um, so I do have this as a resource if you want to learn more about the program. So they're just saving seeds and then um, providing them to different um, tribal organizations so that they can continue to grow um, these indigenous foods. Um, so like I said, I do have that as a resource um, on the end of these slides. And then I do also have it on Mayo Clinic Connect as a link too. So I did that just before the webinar too. And then another um, initiative is in partnership with the North American Traditional Indigenous Food Systems or Natives. Um, and they have videos that feature award-winning chefs and restaurateurs. Um, so Chef Sean Sherman and Crystal Wapipa. Um, and they have recipes, videos that focus on foods within the areas um, all across um, to in different areas um, with different tribes so that um, to pass on the, the tradition of different um, recipes and foods. And then two, just I didn't put this in the slide, but there's also even a handbook on how to transition from cattle to bison, um, which is a partnership with the Intertribal Buffalo Council. Um, and it talks about what is the process of that, the cost um, for tribes if they're interested in that too. So just wanted to mention that as well. And then the also community run solutions. So how can they improve access to affordable, healthy foods? So that could be creating green spaces at home in the neighborhood or within the communities. And it's teaching those skills and knowledge about the environment, um, the planting know-how, um, and then where foods come from. Um, it's known that um, when you, the other thing too, is if you include children in on um, gardening, they're more likely to try different types of foods like fruits or vegetables because um, they're invested in that um, and it promotes local foods and markets like if if you're growing foods you can provide them at different markets um, or support it just supporting the local economy and two just even providing it to each other within the community because you're investing in each other's health and then you're promoting those indigenous foods and traditions and then building on that strength of sharing that knowledge and so far, we've talked about how to access healthy foods for adults, but what about infants? And I talked a little bit about that with the, the WIC program. But I wanted to talk about um, breastfeeding and just how important it is um, with the possibility of preventing um, cancer. And breastfeeding has always been a traditional practice in American Indian and Alaska Native communities, but it's important to talk about the health benefits of breastfeeding for babies as well as for mothers. Um, and you can consider breast milk as the first indigenous food. Um, and statistically, it is um, known that um, native mothers and babies represent the lowest group that exclusively breastfeeds um, for the first six months of life. So really encouraging um, uh, American Indians and, uh, and Alaska native mothers to um, breastfeed is important. And I should also mention though, that it does require commitment. So it's not something that's easily done. I will acknowledge that. Um, but hopefully with talking about some of these benefits, um, and encouraging people within the community to help and support um, mothers to breastfeed, um, we can encourage more people to, to breastfeed. And it does provide all the nutrients that are needed for a baby to grow strong and healthy. Um, I had mentioned that it is recommended to try to exclusively breastfeed for the first six months of life. Um, the breast milk does change over time. Um, and so it adapts to the needs of the baby. And there's evidence that shows um, that obesity rates are significantly lower in breastfed children. And we talked about in the first webinar how um, obesity can contri may um, contribute to some types of cancers. Um, and it also contains compounds that can reduce um, infection, um, whether that's um, just because it has nutrients in it that helps um, the baby fight off infections too. So it's really important to try to do that if, if at all possible. 
And then how does it help the mother? Um, it may reduce the risk of breast and ovarian cancers um, because it can reduce the exposure of certain types of hormones like estrogen, which is um, may promote those certain types of cancers like breast or, or ovarian cancer. And then it also helps mothers return to pre-pregnancy weight um, faster. And I talked, like I said, about um, how certain types of cancers may be um, reduced if you do not carry excess weight. And then even an added benefit is it reduces the risk of developing type two diabetes, um, high blood pressure and heart disease. And those um, chronic conditions are also related to obesity rates. So that's also why it's helpful for that. And it depends on who you talk to. So like I said, it's not always an easy thing to breastfeed, but for some um, it may save time because you're not having to um, make um, formula um, and, and you can just breastfeed whenever the baby is hungry. Uh, so it can be more convenient, but if it's difficult to do, it can be um, not as convenient. Um, so just want to acknowledge that as well. And then I wanted to mention some of the financial benefits. So I wanted to mention this study that was published last year in the Journal of American, uh, I'm sorry, the Journal of Pediatrics, which estimated that if 90% of all U.S. families followed the guidelines to breastfeed exclusively for the first six months of um, a baby's life, the U.S. would annually save $13 billion from reduced medical costs, not, and not even to mention the savings of not having to buy infant formula. And just even the, the, how we experience the shortage of, of um, formula too. Um, so it's also uh, beneficial to just breastfeeding if you're able to do that. Kind of transitioning a little bit, um, I wanted to touch on eating on a healthy budget. Um, so here are a few strategies about how to eat on a healthy budget. Um, the first thing I wanted to touch on is, is um, meal planning. And this could be a whole webinar in itself. And actually there is a webinar recording just on meal planning on Mayo Clinic Connect um, on that video library tab, um, if you wanted to check it out. So it kind of takes a deeper dive into this topic. But um, just to touch on it a little bit. So first of all, what even is meal planning? Um, so it's organizing meals ahead of time. Um, often people think, think that they need to plan for every single meal. That's not true. Um, often people tackle the dinner meal because that's the one that seems most daunting. Um, we often, we could eat lunch um, leftovers from what we made at dinner time. Um, and sometimes people eat this um, similar breakfast each day. So that might not be something that you have to necessarily plan. Um, and the reason that meal planning is so important is it can really save you time, money, and stress when you can plan a few meals at a time. And it's just, it can be created um, on what foods that are on sale, what is in season, or what you have on hand already in your pantry or in your kitchen. Um, and it can be done over a period of time, like a week, um, two weeks, or for a month. So maybe, for example, if you have to go a farther distance to a grocery store, maybe you want to plan um, for a month at a time. It doesn't mean that you have to plan every single meal. So for example, I always like to recommend, like if you're not doing any meal planning, maybe take one or two days a week um, where you can plan a meal at a time. And maybe double a recipe or um, just so you have more of it that you can have throughout the week or freeze it for later. Um, so just want to mention it too. It does, I'm not saying that you have to plan every single meal for a month at a time, um, but whatever is doable for you. Um, and you can really do whatever um, works best for you and thinking about how you want to uh, plan your meals. So you could use pen and paper to kind of think which days of the week, what meals you want to plan. You could use um, a computer document um, or some people use an app on their phone. So it's really whatever works best for you. And um, finding maybe some things that you've made in the past, or you could always look up recipes or some of those videos that I mentioned um, on some more traditional type recipes, maybe you wanna try. Um, but then once you have a meal, then you create your shopping list based on what you need for those meals. Um, and sticking to this list can really help you be efficient in the grocery store. 
And I don't know the exact statistic, but it is shown that if the less time that you spend in the grocery store, the less money you'll spend. And not to mention um, as well, if you're following a list, you won't be purchasing things um, that you're not going to be uh, making some of those impulse buys. Um, so spending less time as well as following a list, you you won't um, make as many of those um, things that you may see when you're you're walking past um, and purchasing some of those things that may not be as health as healthy for us. Um, you can also use grocery store coupons. Some grocery stores offer certain days that they do a double coupon day. Um, so th that's something to consider. Sometimes you can buy in bulk. So if you buy more um, at a time, it's just gonna reduce the cost. And it's important to compare brands. So sometimes an off-brand uh, may be less expensive. And then sometimes they even break down the price per unit if you buy it in bulk. Or you could certainly bring a calculator to kind of calculate that out for you. Um, and then two, I would also say if you're buying in bulk, that could depend if you have enough storage space. So sometimes, you know, some of the bigger grocery stores that you can buy a lot at a time don't work for some people because they just don't have the means to store things. So, but that's just an idea. And then I will also say to not shop when you're hungry, um, just because again, you're gonna see things that will seem more appealing and you're gonna have more of those impulse buys. I mentioned this just a little bit, um, but buying in season some of those fruits and vegetables, they'll also taste better. Um, you can certainly buy canned or frozen fruits or vegetables are a great option as well. So, cause you can just use whatever you need and store the rest. Um, so then you're not um, having to, if things go bad, you don't have to throw them out, which um, wastes money too. If you do buy fruit, make sure it's canned and it's in a hundred percent juice. Um, packed in 100% juice, and then vegetables, I'm um, just not wanting to have them in like creamy sauces necessarily because that will add extra calories. Um, and then these products, um, like for example, often people ask me, well, is frozen just as good as fresh? Um, in some cases, it can be even fresher um, just because when the manu manufacturers are picking things, they're at the peak of the ripeness, and then they do what's called flash freezing. They freeze it very quickly. Um, so it, it just stores all those nutrients in. Um, and then another suggestion that um, Skylar made, I don't do it myself, I probably should learn how to do it, is canning foods um, that could be right from your garden. Um, you put all that work in, um, why not can some of those things and they can be kept sh uh, shelf stable um, on the, the shelf. Um, if you have limited uh, refrigerator or freezer space, the only thing is just to make sure it's not indirect sunlight that you know would. Um, not keep things as fresh. Um, so just mentioning that. And then also thing canned foods um, for things like fish or chicken can be another alternative too. And then um, plant sources of protein, we often spend a lot on protein. That's where a, a major part of our, our grocery bill comes from. So you can certainly buy um, beans or lentils, um, whether that's canned or dried. Um, so you can also keep those too. And that's another alternative. And then making sure if you, you get uh, whole grains, um, at least half of the, your whole grains within a day. Um, so that could include things like wild rice, brown rice, or amaranth is another kind of grain. Or also in that quarter of the, our plate, you could even include starchy vegetables like corn, squash, or pumpkin is also can um, fall into that category as well. And then two, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit um, and talk about the nutrition facts label. Because this can also help us make um, healthier decisions too. And I will say that the nutrition label, facts label came out um, in 1994. And we have not had an update since March of 2020, which is crazy to think. Um, but you may not have even noticed that there was a change because in March of 2020, we had the pandemic. So um, just want to mention that. Um, so I wanted to touch on this as well. Um, so with this, 
what I tell people to look at are, first of all, servings. And servings can, can be listed a couple different ways on the nutrition facts label. So it could be servings per container, or it could also be serving size. Um, and the serving size has just been made more bold, so it kind of calls it out on the label. But one thing that I really want to point out and is often confused is anything having to do with the servings is not the recommended amount that we're supposed to eat. Um, but instead, it's really what people typically consume in a single serving. So both the servings per container and the serving size have been increased to reflect more realistically what people eat um, at one time. Um, so just want to mention that. But the other thing too to take into consideration is calories. So if we were to take this um, nutrition, look at this nutrition facts label, we'll see that the whole container can, has eight servings in it. Now, if you were to eat half of the container, you would have to take the calories and multiply it by four, right? Because this is just for one serving. So one serving is 230 calories, but if we multi if we have half of it, we would have to multiply it by four. So really it's providing 920 calories. So it's just to kind of keep that in mind when you're eating different foods and that can kind of help you um, just keep in mind what you've eaten um, at a time. So the calories are more bold and call it out. It used to have fat calories listed. It doesn't have that anymore. So only calories, because really we're just wanting to look at certain types of fats. It's not um, calling out those fat calories. And just as a rule of thumb, it's not to say you should only have 100 calories at, at a at one time, but it's just using this kind of rule of rule of thumb when you're comparing different products. So for example, if it's a hundred calories per serving, it's something that's like a, a lower calorie item. If it's 400 calories per serving, it's an item that has is higher in calories. So it, it also kind of depends on, is it a snack item or is it something you're going to eat at a meal? So just, just keep that in mind as well. And like I said, that's kind of something you can use to kind of compare products. Okay, so then I want to talk about the percent daily value. Um, the percent daily value is shows how much of a nutrient is in a serving and it can and how much of it it contributes to the total daily diet. Um, all of the just right this the daily servings uh, uh i'm sorry daily values have been updated um because some of those were just uh changed a little bit um but just to kind of consider if you're going to look at that percent daily value that's going to be um located here on the right of the nutrition label and you can use kind of those rule of thumbs rule of thumb um to kind of help guide you again on what may be better options, um, food options. So if something is less than or equal to 5% daily value of a particular nutrient, it's considered low. And if it's greater than or equal to 20% of a certain nutrient, it's considered high. So just keep that in mind because as we go to the next slide, um, this is going to make a little bit more sense. So I'm going to kind of go through these three things. I grouped these three, I guess you could call them nutrients or things to look at on the nutrition label together, um, saturated and trans fat, sodium and added sugars all together because if um, foods that are higher in amounts of all three of these um, things on the label are gonna be typically more processed foods. And we had talked a little bit about in the first webinar that we wanna stay away from, from foods that are more processed because they're gonna be typically higher in calories, um, they're gonna be higher in sodium and they're gonna have added sugars. Um, so they're just not gonna provide a lot of nutrients, I guess is what is my point. Um, and they can lead to weight gain and they're not gonna have a lot of fiber in them too. So for example, with fat calories, um, it's, we want to really focus on saturated and trans fats. Those are going to be the things um, that are going to contribute to um, 
adding more calories and they're not going to be good for our health because overall health. So not cancer related, but it also can affect heart health too. Um, so saturated fat and trans fats can affect, can contribute to heart disease. And I don't know um, if some people have heard in the news that, that um, there they may think that trans fats are completely eliminated or phased out, but this is not true. Many food manufacturers don't have to list trans fat um, if it's less than 0.5 grams per serving. Um, but a product may have trans fat in it, but again, it's just a smaller amount. And this is even more strongly linked to heart disease. So it's, and the recommended amount for trans fat is to keep the total amount less than two grams per day. Um, one way to, you know, if it still shows zero grams of trans fat, you can look on the list of the ingredients. Um, and if it says partially hydrogenated, whatever kind of oil or fat, um, that is going to be a trans fat. So that's another way to identify it. Um, so we want these three um, things on the nutrition facts label when we're looking at them, we want them to be low. We want them to be less than that at or less than 5%. Um, so um, for example, sodium is the next thing that I'm gonna talk about too. The recommended amount is 2,300 2, milligrams per day for the whole day. Um, and typically uh, Americans eat 3,200 milligrams per day. So we eat a lot. And often when I would talk to people, they'd be like, well, I don't use the salt shaker. Um, but really where a lot of the salt or sodium that we take in a day is coming from processed foods as well as when we eat out. So just keep that in mind. So thinking, um, do I eat a lot of processed foods? Am I eating out? So I may be getting more sodium than I really think th that I am. Um, and you can look up some items um, on menus, sometimes they have the nutrition information. So sometimes that's kind of interesting to look at as well to see how much sodium, um, saturated or trans fat, as well as added sugars are in certain types of foods. Added sugars. Um, so those are things, again, that are going to be in more processed foods and they're added um, on into things uh, that could be listed as just plain sugar. They could be listed as sugar that comes in the form of uh, syrups, honey, um, and they, are, they could also be listed as uh, concentrated fruit or vegetable juices. And they're required to be listed on the label as grams and then also, like I said, as that percent daily value. So again, all of these things, um, the saturated fat, trans fat, sodium and added sugars, we want them to be low. So we want them to be at that less than or equal to 5% of the daily value. And then things that we want to be higher or greater or equal to 20% more of a nutrient would be things like dietary fiber. Remember, we talked about how that's really important, may help reduce our risk of colorectal cancer. It's also healthy for our heart too. And other nutrients um, that are typically lacking in the American diet would be like vitamin D, calcium, iron, and potassium. So you see those listed at the bottom. Those also have that percent daily value. So you want those to be higher. Okay. So again, greater than or equal to 20%. It's not to say you can't have things with less um, than those nutrients, but it's just kind of, again, when you're comparing different types of foods, you can kind of see um, where you want to try to choose something that's a little bit higher or lower, depending on, on what you're looking at. Then I want to touch on, I, I mentioned this even in the first webinar, how do you even identify what is a whole grain? I keep using that term a lot. Um, they're just going to be naturally high in fiber. They're going to have some protein, um, which helps keep you full and satisfied and can help you maintain a healthy body weight. Um, also, whole grains are linked to a lower risk of heart disease, diabetes, and again, like I said, certain types of cancers. Um, so the dietary guidelines recommend that at least half the grains that you eat be whole. So you can identify them a couple ways. One way is by just looking at the ingredient list. Um, the top one has whole, whatever kind of grain it is. It's gonna say whole 
wheat flour, like that first one or whole, whatever kind of grain it is, um, versus something that would say enriched wheat flour, which is gonna be more processed and not considered a whole grain. So that's one way to identify it. Um, and then another way would be to um, look on the front of the package. I will say though that not every food item that is considered a whole grain has this food stamp, this yellow food stamp that I have on the left. Some food products have it, some do not. But if they do have it, that's an easy way to know that it has whole grains in it. And some of the stamps say 100%, some say 50%, but either way, it's just, if you see that stamp, you know it has whole grain in it. So um, those are a couple ways that you can identify whole grains. And then I also wanted to mention, I think I again mentioned this in the first webinar, but just also want to say that um, if you don't like the texture of certain types of whole grain products, um, like pasta, you could certainly do half whole grain, half um, regular and wit enriched um, pasta. So that's at least like trying to introduce it a little at a time. Um, with bread, there's some breads that are whole white wheat bread. Um, so that will um, have a similar texture to white bread, but it has whole grain called um, white wheat in it. So that is also considered a whole grain. So just as an idea, if that's something that um, you wanted to try. So just in summary, um, wanted to touch about touch on these these topics. So um, kind of a variety of different topics that I talked about today, um, but just wanting to make sure if you're experiencing food insecurity um, to access food programs, talk about it with your healthcare provider or dietitian to help you get access to different food programs, whatever might work for you. Um, considering indigenous food systems, um, whether that's um, watching, trying some some recipes or watching some of those videos or growing foods for you. Um, it's it's not to say that that works for everybody, but if you if you have um, don't have the best uh, soil conditions, you can certainly have a raised uh, garden bed that may help you um, be able to grow some foods. And it's it is work. I'm not going to say it's easy, but it's something maybe as a community you could work together as. Um, to, to grow some of those different kinds of foods. And then I touched on a few things of considering some budget-friendly suggestions like meal planning, start small, um, a couple times a week maybe, um, looking for coupons, basing what meals you're gonna have throughout the week um, on coupons or what's in season, that will just help things be a little bit lower cost. And as al always with all of my webinars, um, just being gentle with yourself because making change is, is difficult. So starting small can really have a big impact over time. So um, these are a couple resources. Like I said, I put the connect link in the chat. Um, but again, it will be on that resource page that is on our video library tab. Um, and then I talked a little bit about the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance to check that out. Um, this uh, FDPIR sharing gallery has a lot of those videos and some of these different resources have kind of cross over with some of the things, but they're just presented a little bit differently. So maybe um, you may find things a little bit easier to, to look at. Um, and then the Food Sovereignty Initiative, as well as the Natives, um, one of those uh, initiatives more in detail. So I would like to close out this session and let you know that once this webinar has ended, you will be prompted to take a quick survey. This information is helpful to provide feedback on how we can improve this session or learn what other cancer-related topics you would be interested in learning about. Thank you.